Testing to come on to. Please, we want to start. Can you sit? Good morning, everybody. Dear uh, Director General of Israel Space Agency, Mr. Uri Oron, Director General of the French Space Agency, Mr. Lionel Souchet, and representative of the French and Italian Space Agencies, honorable guests, ladies and gentlemen, here in Dubai and on the virtual platform. Due to COVID-19 restrictions, we will have the, an hybrid event, which is live broadcast to you on YouTube. Good morning and shalom. My name is Noah Barak, and I'm honored to welcome you to the Venus and Shalom Remote Sensing for the Benefit of Earth event. Remote sensing through satellites is an extreme motor in monitoring electronic phenomenon, climate change, and exploring the Earth's natural resources. Spectral remote sensing is the forepoint of the technology and an important element in producing essential data for Earth exploration. Today, we'll introduce two leading projects in the field of spectral remote sensing, Venus Mission and Shalom Project, together with our partners in CNES, the French Space Agency, and ASI, the Italian Space Agency, both global leading agencies in remote sensing. I would like to thank our partners in organizing this event and who joined us to mon morning? Who joined us this morning from Italy and France? We will start with general overview of the Venus mission, scientific research and applica ap applications. Therefore, we will present the Shalom project in the same format. Venus project will be presented by Dr. Adi Nino Greenberg and Professor Arnon Carnielli on behalf of the Israel Space Agency and Ben Gurion University. On behalf of CNES, the presenters will be Jean-Louis Renault, an expert in image quality monitoring systems and currently in charge of the image quality operations for megatropics in Venus satellites. In addition, Mr. Arthur Dick is the space imagery performance engineer and he is in charge of the Venus project's radiomatics quality. Shalom project will be presented by Dr. Anin Indio Greenberg and Professor Eyal Bendor from Tel Aviv University. On behalf of the Italian Space Agency, we will be presenting Mr. Francesco Longo, ASI Head of Earth Observation Unit, and Dr. Fabrizia Bongiorno, Director of Technology Research at INGV. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm glad to introduce Mr. Uri Oron, the Director General of the Israeli Space Agency, and invite him for opening greetings. Please. <clears throat> Thanks, Noah. Thanks very much. Uh, good morning, Director General. Uh, good morning, friends and colleagues uh, from ASI and from, uh, from CNES professors, uh, distinguished guests here uh, in Dubai and back home, uh, watching us uh, via Zoom. Good morning, everyone. Uh, and thanks very much for joining us today. Uh, and welcome to the Israeli Pavilion. Uh, if you do have some time, go and visit. 
uh, after it's worthwhile. So, uh, so please do that. And before I, um, I will have a few quick, uh, quick uh, opening remarks, I would like to thank Dr. Wardin Nino Greenberg. Where are you? Taking photos. Um, uh, she's leading the science program in uh, the Israeli Space Agency. I think all of you know her very, very well, but she did an uh, extremely uh, great effort to arrange, uh, arrange this, uh, this event here um, at the pavilion and uh, via Zoom, and to Noah Barak, our spokesman, for their help and support. Um, we are living in, in troubling times. Uh, as all of us uh, know, I just took off the mask. That's one example. Um, the pandemic changed us all. Uh, we're having this session in a hybrid mode, uh, as, um, as you know. Climate change and its outcomes affects our life daily. Uh, people in Europe uh, feel that. We are in Israel, feel that. People in the Mediterranean feel that everybody uh, feels the outcome of the climate change. And I haven't said a word about data, fake and real data. Uh, so we are living in troubling times. And people tend to say nowadays that the space is changing. That's not true. Space is not changing, it was there all the time. What is changing is our capabilities and the potential to use space. That, was, uh, that is, that is the, the, the change. And, that, and this change is, is huge. Uh, uh, what we can get out of space is becoming not a real challenge, it's become a huge opportunity for nations, for private sectors, and for people. And I think what we are doing here today is really a great example of what we can do with research, as well as with uh, 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 commercial implications that we can be driven out of those projects. And uh, uh, those two projects that we will be, we'll discuss today, I think brings a great example of what we can achieve in space and they are really, really very relevant to our um, real life. Uh, and in that sense, um, I think it's fascinating to discuss those two different uh, uh, projects that are in different phases in their life, but both of them have the potential to affect millions and millions. We can do that only by cooperating. Right now in this room, sitting uh, uh, people from different nations, at least three, but I think even more from different nations, and I hope that uh, uh, watching us people from other nations, especially our, our uh, uh, hosts from, uh, from the UAE, uh, who can and will join a few of those projects, uh, because the only way and the right way to proceed in such huge projects is by doing them together. Uh, and uh, the way we are doing those two projects, Venus and Shalom, are a great example of cooperations between nations between organizations, between research organizations, and between people. So with that, I'm honored to open this morning's session and hope we will have a fruitful and beneficial one. I know it's going to be uh, uh, such a day. Thanks very much in advance for all of you, and let's have a very good day. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Oron. I'm honored to invite Mr. Lionel Suchet Director General of the France Space Agency, please. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, first, I would like to, to thank uh, the Israel Ministry of uh, Innovation, Science and Technology and you, uh, Mr. General, for having organized this, uh, this day and this important meeting. And also say that I'm very pleased to have here my uh, Italian colleagues. Uh, and it's a very good idea to have joined these two programs together and to have here in the same room uh, the Israeli Space Agency, the Italian Space Agency, and the CNES, the CNES French Space Agency. I think it's a very good idea. Thanks a lot for that. As you said, uh, space is in the heart of a revolution, a big evo evolution. I don't know if you can say uh, it's changing. Yes, space is not changing, but all the application, all the domain is changing very fast. And uh, we are going from a pure uh, etatic economy. I mean, uh, all the agencies around the world have built uh, on two pillars. I mean, science, knowledge, and defense. Uh, it's important for space and still more and more important. But it was 
a, a very close economy, etatic economy, and we are going to a very more open economy with more and more societal and economic challenges uh, and, and, and private initiatives. And that's a big change for all of us. Um, and it's mainly due to digital revolution, which allows to, 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 to keep the data and to, to deal with this data uh, as massive way to propose from this data services and not only data satellite by satellite, that's why also important to have two missions here, but uh, data from different satellites and data from in situ measurement on the ground and to have all that together in order to make services for, for, for all economic uh, uh, aspects. Uh, it's also due also to, to, to miniaturization of our technology, which allows now to not to make the same, but to make a lot of things with small satellites, which is, wasn't possible uh, a few years uh, ago. And now uh, we can address, uh, as I said, societal uh, uh, challenges such as climate change. You, you, you told that it's very important. La land management, environmental situation in general, pollution and so on but also economy, and now we are working in, in CNES, not only with people from science and defense, we have known them from the very beginning, but from people from agriculture, fisheries, mobility, health, uh, even tourism. And uh, so it's a quite new job for us to deal with all these, uh, these, uh, these domains. And in, in these domains, Earth observation, uh, with a huge amount of data collected all around the Earth, plays a very important role, for sure. And in this domain, precision is less a challenge nowadays than the repetitivity of the observation, which are more and more important. And small satellites also play an important role, a crucial role, because of the capacity to have low price, new entrepreneurship, and, and new possibilities to invest in these systems, and which allows also a constellation of, of satellites to make observation. And when I've said that, you understand why, how, and how uh, Venus is crucial and suits so well uh, to all these challenges. Because G Venus is for vegetation and environment on a new micro satellite. So you have all that uh, vegetation, environment, which is very important in the, for the future from space, uh, uh, with an innovative instrument, it will be presented, uh, and on an innovative platform which is the other part of the new micro satellite, which is also very important for the future exploitation uh, uh, of, space, uh, of space systems. So we are in the art of, uh, of, of that, uh, of the future. And it, uh, this, uh, this cooperation was very, very important. And for that, I renew my thanks uh, to this very important cooperation. Uh, and I'm very proud to say here today that we have done Venus together. I'm very proud of that. Thanks, thanks again. And now you have, we have to go further. I mean, first to use uh, the, uh, Venus as much as we can, and we have to do that. And uh, I, I congratulate you for having signed yesterday this LOI with, uh, with, uh, with the Emirati about the use of, of Venus data. It's very important for all of us. So first, first of all, to, to use Venus, and then to think about the future of our cooperation, and we will do that together. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Mr. Suchet. And now I'm honored to invite Sveva Yakovovi, right? I hope I pronounced it right, from the ASI. Thank you. So, good morning. Shalom to all. It's a pleasure to be here. And I would like to thank, first of all, the Ministry of Innovation, Science and Technology for having organized this trilateral event. And of course, the Israel Space Agency in the person of the new Director General. But I cannot forget uh, Adi, which has been a really very precious in this organization. So we're talking about uh, remote sensing for the benefit of Earth, and of course, our other partner, which is CNES, here represented by Lionel Suchet. The value of Earth observation here is the value of international cooperation. 
this is very important. So I think, you know, uh, the Shalom and the Venus uh, missions are very important missions that uh, uh, surely demonstrate the value of bilateral cooperation. Because Earth observation is for the care of everyone. It's for the care of planet. And it nurtures on international cooperation. So um, I think uh, this has been pointed out already by the Director General of the Israeli Space Agency. Um, now the importance of Earth and the protection of our planet is almost is always more important and uh, we have to go on uh, in this track and that's what we're doing and we hope to be able to launch soon our joint mission on Shalom. I will not get into the details because these will be part of the rest of the workshop with my colleagues and I wish you all a very fruitful discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sleva. After all the greetings, we will start the professional part. I'm glad to invite Dr. Adini Nogimbel from Israeli Space Agency, please. Hello everyone and good morning. Thank you for the kind introduction and all your uh, warm and friendly words. Um, I really appreciate it. Actually, it's very nice to meet you uh, and not via Zoom. Um, so my name is Dr. Adin Inyo Greenberg. I'm a planetary scientist. Um, I'm standing here to present uh, our two um, successful collaborations uh, actually, Mr. Shmayawa Mr. Viad, which is the project manager of these two uh, leading uh, uh, projects, uh, could not be here with us. Uh, and I hope I will do uh, a good job. <laughs> not as he, but I will do my best. So I'm going to talk about uh, a general view of the Venus mission, which is, of course, a successful collaboration with uh, ESA and uh, CNES. Uh, ESA is, of course, for vegetation and environment microsatellite. Uh, as you all know, it was launched in August 2017 and is doing great work since then. So Venus satellite has two missions. The first one is scientific. It's for Earth observation, for land and environment, water body, water body monitoring, precise agriculture, and many more um, research uh, cases. Uh, which will be performing, which is performing by multispectral imaging. Uh, our PI, our scientific PI for this project is Professor Arnon Kern-Eli from uh, Ben Gurion University. Arnon, thank you for uh, coming uh, to uh, this event. He is going to present the scientific uh, research and applications. And of course, we have a technological mission for validation and demonstration of the whole effect uh, thruster on board the Venus uh, satellite um, to to demonstrate and to validate the possibility of enhancement of uh, Leo transfer um, during the mission. I will talk about it later. So this is the Venus satellite um, during its integration in the IAI in Israel. Um, on the left side, you can see the satellite and on the right, you can see the um, super spectral um, um, payload um, that has 12 spectral bands in veneer and the whole effect raster uh, just beneath it. As for Venice architecture, as you can see, um, the light blue is the CNES part and the other um, colors are for Israel. ESA is responsible for the spacecraft bus satellite integration, engineering data, and satellite control center, including mission operations, um, as you can see uh, on the left. NASA is responsible for the science mission center, including the science data processing center and programming center. NASA is also providing the super spectral camera. 
as for our status where we are now, so as I said before, um, Venus satellite was launched uh, on August 2017. We are now, uh, after two and a half successful uh, years in the mission, uh, we started at uh, 720 kilometers. And after that, during the technological mission, uh, we transferred the uh, satellite um, in different layer orbits from 720 to 410. And now we are climbing, climbing back uh, to 560 kilometers. And as for, and we are going to stay there and we're going to arrive there uh, by the end of uh, 2021. And at the beginning of 2022, we will start uh, operating for two more years uh, in this uh, um, in this 560 kilometers. It, of course, will be a sun-synchronic orbit. Uh, it will be, it will allow us a daily revisit um, for the selected areas and a special resolution of four meters. I would like to um, to share with you um, how successful Venus satellite or Venus mission is. Um, during the last year, um, we um, published together, Kness and ESA, international call for proposal for researchers from all over the world, and more than 20 um, proposals were submitted for many areas around the world. So it is truly a great mission. I would like to thank you once again for being here. For the CNES part, I would like to call Mr. Jean-Louis Renaud and Arthur Dick, please. Thank you, Eddie. So, Good morning, everybody. I'm Arthur Dick from CNES, and I'm in charge of the radiometric quality of uh, image um, of Venus image. And we are here today with John Witt to talk about the mission, Venus mission overview and CNES activities on this project. So this, uh, this work is a result of a team effort. So I would like to thank all the team members and Israeli partners. So after um, a brief presentation of the mission overview and its different phases presented by Jean-Louis, uh, I will describe briefly the Venus instrument and its projects. Uh, then I will show you a synopsis of CNES activities on this project. And finally, I will conclude with, uh, with the key points. Thank you, Arthur. So Jean-Louis Reynaud from CNES in charge of the image monitoring operations for, uh, for Venus. Um, so as you can see on the top of this slide, and as Adi told before, it's a great cooperation between a lot of agencies, entities, laboratories. And on the CNES side, uh, we mainly focus on this mission, on the scientific part of the mission, which is the uh, Earth observation and the, in and the vegetation and land monitoring operations. And this is thanks to the VSS camera on board the Venus mission, which is a super spectral camera. And what is very important to, to recall and to remember is that Venus is a unique combination. It's really important, a unique combination of various features, 12 spectral bands uh, from visible to near infrared, uh, high spatial resolution, five meter resolution, a high revisit period. It is quite important, the two day revisit period, and also a high agility. All these features are really unique on the satellite, on the micro satellite. And thanks to this, during the first 2.5 years of the mission, the VM1 mission, we have been able to, to capture and to acquire 159 scientific sites all around the world on a wide range of different climates and types of surfaces and so on. And also, and this I recall that they are all uh, available on the TEIA data land portal. And now, ladies and gentlemen, please fasten your seat belts because Venus is a roller coaster mission, in fact. We have just finished the two first phases of the mission, VM1 and VM2. Uh, and now we are on the low orbit on 410 kilometers with the VM3 mission. And we are soon will begin the transition up to the new uh, exciting new orbit at, on 560 kilometer it's a vm5 
mission and we will be there in another unique combination because we will be at one day revisit period and this is quite important to add new uh, new ideas on the algorithms to, to validate this is uh, this slide is to show you how visually it is to be on the vn3 orbit in fact uh, vn3 lower better smaller lower orbit we was we are we are now at 410 and we were at 720 kilometers a uh, lower orbit better resolution three meter rather the five meter the vm1 mission and smaller footprint you can see here the example on the same site it's a new zealand site which were acquired during the vm1 it's the blue the blue uh, the blue square and uh, now acquiring in the vm3 uh, orbit the red part, so you can see the difference. And the VM5 will be an intermediary between these two acquisitions and these two orbits. So now uh, Arthur will uh, speak about the, the payloads on board. So thank you, Jean-Louis. So as Jean-Louis just said, and I did just show you, um, Venus has two different missions. The first one, which is the reason we are here today with Jean-Louis, the scientific mission. With the, with the radiometer, which has 12 spectral bands in the visible and near infrared. And the second one is a technological mission, which is called IET, and with um, small thrusters based on all effects. So um, Venus provides information on 12 spectral, spectral bands in the visible and near infrared. And you can see here on the left of the slide a comparison of all spectral response of Venus and Sentinel 2A spectral bands in the same wave of uh, range of wavelength. The main specificities of Venus uh, spectral bands are the stereoscopic bands B5 and B6 used for cloud detection among other things and the lack of swear bands so we don't have a uh, cirrus detection band. So let's, uh, let's, let's talk about uh, Venus products. What are the, the different levels? So here are presented the different uh, Venus level products. So firstly, we have the level zero with the raw data of the 12 spectral band. Then the radiometric calibration generates the level 1A and the geometric calibration, the level 1. These type of atmosphere reflectance products are available for scientists. Uh, also, there is, uh, there is also a cloud, uh, a cloud mask. Um, a cloud mask is also provided with, this, uh, with these products. After level two, after atmospheric correction, and level three, after computation of time series, are also provided in the in the data service center. So CNES is in charge of the of the radiometer and, in particular, of its calibration. So what is a calibration of satellite? So we can, if we want to summarize very briefly, a calibration of a satellite, we can ask two questions. The first one: at what color is the pixel? And the second one: and where is its location? So the radiometric calibration concerns the first question and the geometric calibration deals with the second one. And if we can answer to these two questions, we can say that the satellite is well calibrated. So there are a lot of, um, there are a lot of steps in the image processing chain, but we can extract three main activities on each calibration. So the radiometric calibration consists of, of uh, non-uniformity and stratite correction and instrument tuning and graduation, which is called also absolute calibration. Whereas uh, geometric calibration, for the geometric calibration, map projection, multispectral, and multi-temporal consistency are the three main activities. Obviously, there are a lot of other things to do, but today we don't have the time to describe uh, precisely every step of the image processing chain. But here are some examples of, of other activities such as performance assessments, reference image, images generation, or investigation in case of anomalies. So to illustrate my point, just some venous acquisition over calibration sites. So you can see here on the, on the left of the slide, there's a sites uh, over Algeria, Arabia, and Libya used for um, equalization and absolute calibration. At the top, you can see also uh, simultaneous nature observation with Sentinel-2 over different sites in China, USA, and Peru. And moon acquisition used for uh, absolute calibration and temporal monitoring. At the bottom of the slide, you can see uh, specific scientific sites over Australia, USA, and Argentina used for uh, geometric correlation. And finally, on the, on the right, you can see snow sites 
in Antarctic and Greenland used for equalization. So to conclude this presentation, concerning product performances, the overall VM1 product quality is highly satisfactory because radiometric quality is well monitored. The, for example, the accuracy of absolute calibration is under 3% for most of the bands. The geometric quality is good also because multi-temporal consistency is under 3 meters and multi-spectral consistency is under, under 2 meters for more than 90% of the product. Please note that a reprocessing is in progress. All the VM1 archive is currently reprocessed with an updated tuned configuration of all processing parameters to take into account geometric and radiometric calibration monitoring and some uh, evolution of algorithms such as cloud detection. As we said uh, earlier, two-day revisit and five-meter resolution provide crucial information in specific cases as you can see on the in the animation on the right of the of this slide, uh, on this time series, over one scientific site in Australia where there were forest fires. These features, uh, it's planned that its features will be enhanced in the VM5 phase with a one-day revisit cycle and um, a spatial resolution of about four meters. And finally, just to remind you that the products are freely available on the TEA Data Service Center with the URL at the bottom of this slide. So thank you for your attention, and if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Good morning, everybody. My name is Oman Pamieli. I'm show free at least. Okay. <laughs> I'm working with the Venus project for many, many years, more than 20 years, even before the uh, connection with the uh, French satellite. Fresh agency, and I, in this presentation, I really want to shed light on some of the highlights, the specialization of this satellite. So the, the agreement with CNES was signed on the, the in on 12 of April 2005, and the launch was on the 1st of August 2017 from French Guiana. And I would like to mention also that the name, it's a, it, we call it Venus, but the, the real name is Venus, because we uh, call it Ven vegetation and environment, new micro satellite, and the new here is for the micro. Okay. Now the special characteristic of the uh, mission, it's that uh, it, the visit time is two days, and the source is about 27 kilometers. We have a five meter resolution in Nadir, 12 spectral bands in the visible near infrared. And uh, we are able to tilt the satellite up to 30 degrees across track at a long track. And this is very unique. But on behalf of this, we are imaging the ground every time in the same view and get. Now, the mission, uh, the, the VM1 uh, last more than four years, and we are uh, looking for uh, more, uh, several more uh, years with the uh, VM3 and VM5. Now, this is, uh, these are the, the spectral bands, and you see that it's very uh, dense in the visible near infrared, but they are very unique. We have application on land, we have application on water, and we have application of the air of the atmosphere. These are the spread of the 159 uh, sites uh, worldwide. 27 tiles are over Israel. And I always ask how we are getting 27 tiles 
in Israel with the same on, on the same uh, uh, flight on the same day and I would like to explain this uh, issue we started to image Israel when the satellites hit far in the north in Turkey and we are looking forward and we start uh, imaging the West Street and this is taking about uh, uh, 36 seconds we complete to uh, to observe 12 uh, times now the camera started or turned into a standby mode and the satellite turned around and after a uh, 35 seconds we are starting to see or to observe with a backward view the history and this is very important because in the history we have the Kinere, the Sea of Galilee which is the main water reservoir in Israel and we would like to see in a backward view because the sun the water glint in this uh, in this position after completing the east trip the satellite also uh, uh, entering to uh, the camera entering to a uh, sent by mode and we started to observe the the uh, third south uh, strip for 30 seconds okay at the whole we have 27 uh, tiles in 161 seconds now also one of the unique a characteristic of the satellite are four spectral band on the red edge the red edge is a the the a dramatic increase of reflectance from the between the red and the near infrared this is a very problematic a region to observe from space because we don't have the a, the, the level of the reflectance we can't uh, see the level of the reflectance in this region it's only several tenths of a nanometer in wide in the red edge li line shift from a longer uh, wavelength during the plant growth and to the shorter wavelengths when the plant is under stress or during senescence and this is very important for many agricultural uh, uh, application how we measure it we are trying to assess the inflection point if you are looking on this graph as a mathematical function you see the s and in the s we have the inflection point between the uh, the one side of the function to the other side of the function so let's give you a, only three examples how uh, this uh, a very important region can be applied you see here a, a bunch of a spectral a curves of in a wheat or potato fields. And when, when we are applying the NDVI, which is the most common vegetation index, we see that it's getting into a saturation layer. So we can't get any data. But when we are applying the red edge index, we get a straight line and higher a correlation with many uh, variables like leafy rain index, nitrogen, chlorophyll, and others. This is another example over a one yard with the Another very unique characteristic or application of uh, uh, the satellite is uh, water quality. When we are looking on the water quality, even of a small reservoir in northern Negev, we see the difference in colors, and these two images are only five days apart. Okay? Yes, we water, we water, we water, we water. 
So because of the high visit time and the high spectral resolution, we can assess the water quality and it's very difficult to uh, measure the water quality in any other uh, method. This is the Sea of Galilee that I mentioned before. This is a true color uh, composite. On April, we are getting, or we are measuring a lot of sediments. The sediments coming by washing the soil from the north, uh, from the Jordan River. On the uh, June, we are getting chlorophyll, and chlorophyll are nutrients that are washed from the uh, agricultural activity in the north uh, west of the lake. And in July, when the water level is quite low, we can measure a toxic algae uh, bloom. And this is also showing the dynamics of the water quality that we uh, can measure with the satellite. The short visit time is crucial for agricultural uh, activities. Here we see the, the uh, dynamics of uh, the temporal dynamics of alfalfa peel, and we see that by measuring the phenology, the cycle of the, uh, the peel, we are getting, we, we can follow on many agricultural uh, uh, activities in the field. We see here four uh, cycles of uh, sowing and the uh, harvest of the alfalfa. This is another uh, field. It's located in the northern Negev, and we see the dynamics of the uh, cultivated area uh, of different farms in this area. What we are using it, we can assess, for instance, the yield. These three farms that I'm showing here are only 20 kilometers apart, but in the northern uh, in the northern uh, farm, the rain starts in the beginning of the season, while in the southern part, only 20 kilometers apart, at the end of the season. So we have here different application that we see that the, the yield are totally different between these the three farms. The phenological for one of these farms, it's a, it's a, a variant with time. We see that the variation here on the uh, upper left uh, panel, how we interpret it. We see on the lower uh, part that the greener in the uh, green up uh, season, we see the early sowing, the intermediate sowing, the late sowing. In the heading time, all the curves coming to one uh, level. But in the senescence area, we can see that we can separate the product, the, the productivity or the usage of the, uh, these uh, fields. And we can separate between the silage harvest, the hay harvest, and the grain harvest. Here in this area, we, in this slide, I'm showing the difference in the yield between the rain fed and the irrigated field. The rain fed on the left side, the irrigated, sorry, the uh, irrigated on the left side, and the rain fed on the uh, right side. And we measure a 66 percent difference between these two uh, irrigation steps. Now, my French uh, colleagues mentioned the Sentinel-2, and as a matter of fact, Venus was born as a demonstration satellite for Sentinel. Now, when we are comparing the two systems, and Sentinel-2 has two uh, satellites, constellation of two satellites, now when we are looking in the upper part of these uh, uh, four panels, we see the revisit time of the Venus in comparison to the uh, Sentinel. And we see that we have much more images in the Venus than in the, uh, in the Sentinel. Also from the spatial uh, point of view, we see that uh, the Venus can 
observed much more details than the Sentinel because we have in the Venus 5 meter resolution, in the Sentinel 10 and 20 meter resolution, and these are the uh, comparison between the NDVI or the red edge images, and we see that the Venus produces uh, uh, much more uh, details. So, just to summarize, we have the Venus, but there are other satellites in orbit. There are satellites with a better spatial resolution, with a special with better spectral resolution, and with better uh, temporal resolution. But the combination of these three characteristics make the Venus much, a uh, much special or better satellite. Thank you very much for that. So with this presentation, we will uh, introduce uh, more um, scientific applications we can be derived from the Venus products. And you can see, as Arnon uh, showed you, that uh, the scientists have a lot of imagination to use the Venus products. Um, one of the first uh, application uh, we have is uh, stereoscopy. In fact, uh, uh, um, with all the, the features of Venus, uh, you, you, you have uh, see uh, today there's um, something which is very interesting it is that venus has been designed with a stereoscopic component that means that we have two spectral bands on board v5 and v6 which correspond to the same wavelength and which can observe the, the same ground location but with a slight delay and a slight difference of uh, angle in the observation so as you can see, this enables us to retrieve three-dimensional uh, observation and measurements thanks to a base over height ratio. The first application we can have on this topic is the cloud measurements. Indeed, you can see that viewing the clouds from two different points of view, we can both estimate the position of the cloud and also what is very new for Venus. It is the altitude of the cloud. And by computing the altitude of the cloud, you can retrieve also the shadow of the cloud on the ground. And these both information, the shadow and the cloud position, are provided to the users using some specific data masks uh, in the products, in the Venus products. That means that the user, the scientist, can use more efficiently the Venus products by excluding cloudy and shadowy pixels. And of course, when we think, when you speak about stereoscopy, you already uh, think about a digital surface model. By viewing, again, two different point of view of the same ground location, you can intersect the viewing direction and you can retrieve the altitude. Um, on the left part of this slide, you can see the one site in French, it's FRLQ one site in the Massif Central, so you have plains and mountains. And again, by computing B5 and B6 by the stereoscopic component, you can compute a digital surface model on this part, which enables us to retrieve the altitude of the ground and also of the surface object, the trees, the altitude, and so on. And what, you, what is very interesting is that if you compute this digital surface model with SRTM, which is, which is a digital terrain model, that is to say an estimation of the bare earth surface, excluding the trees and the surface object, by, com by making a difference between the Venus DSM and the SRTM, you are able to retrieve some important uh, features on the landscape, like, for example, forest. So it suggests that the quality of the Venus DSM is quite good to uh, use it in the, in the topic of digital software modeling computing. Another, maybe unexpected uh, new uh, topic is possible with Venus is the bathymetry. Indeed, today, most of the worst people, and in Dubai, it's a 
it's already the case, most of the people live within 50 kilometers of coast, river coast, sea coast, and so on. So increasing our knowledge of the dynamics of the coastal, the coastal evolution, and so on, even if even more in the context of the global warming today, it's very important to increase our knowledge. And Venus, again, by its spatial resolution, by its time of visit, and using its B5 and B6, again, it's a perfect candidate to estimate bathymetry using a space instrument. And it has been proven since some years now that the space instruments are quite good now to estimate some underwater measurements. For this, we used a specific site in the US, which is the duck site. So you can see it. Oh, sorry. Let's see. You can see it on the, on the left. It's on the east coast of the US. And it's an important site because it is well known for the high quality and the high quantity of measurements it has on hydrodynamics and morphodynamics measurements. So using this site, we were able to compute both above water, the topography, and under water, the bathymetry, with Venus satellite. And you can see on the right the differences between the Venus satellite measurement for this coastal continuum, the, the topography and the bathymetry, if we compare it with the LIDAR survey, which is quite well known to have very good measurements on this type of, uh, of uh, specific measurements. In fact, it is the, the, the estimation of the bathymetry using Venus is using the wave propagation analysis. You have the reference at the end of the presentation. And when you can, what you can see if we compare the Venus measurements and the LIDAR measurements is that they are quite consistent. In fact, even if Venus is not able to retrieve the shoreline and the near shore measurements, it is well, uh, very well to um, retrieve the, the bathymetry and the topography. It is the uh, RMS, the root mean square for the measurement of the bathymetry is only 0 0.9 meters. So it's quite good and it's quite an interesting topic to use with Venus pellets. Uh, LIDAR is by plane. Yes, it's a comparison of an airborne measurement and a space measurement. Another quite unexpected for vegetation satellite is the ice measurements, the ice studies that are uh, possible with Venus products. You have there an example of a three-dimensional uh, video observed with a combination of 100 Venus images on the Kumbu site, which is an Everest, uh, Everest glacier site in, in the Himalaya. And in fact, by combining the high resolution, the high time we visit, you can build new uh, measurements uh, to see the evolution of the glacier and the movement of the glacier. You can measure albedo, you can observe the crevasses, and all different topics in the ice domain can be addressed thanks to Venus products. But of course, vegetation, Venus, vegetation. Vegetation is the main topic for Venus. And in fact, the high quality for the geometric performances for Venus is quite important to obtain time series on equatorial sites. In fact, on the forest and equatorial site, it's quite difficult to have time series, consistent time series, because there are a lot of clouds and the homogeneity of the landscape is quite difficult to register the different images. But thanks to the quality and the competitor of Venus, it is possible to obtain some time series, a high quality time series of these on these sites. And you have on the left an, uh, an, ex an example, an animation of, uh, on, a, on a, an Amazonian site, and you can see some deforestation areas. And in fact, using NDVI, uh, by computing some NDVI uh, variables or vegetation index, you can test, validate algorithms to uh, to study and monitor some deforestation areas, which is really important uh, with Venus products. As Arnaud told you also, we compare Sentinel-2 and Venus, and this slide, this slide emphasizes the advantages of the time we visit of Venus if we compare it with Sentinel-2. On the top of the slide, you have the Sentinel-2 time series, which cannot observe the flowering of a rape seed code. You see that the, the, the period of the two uh, satellite Sentinel-2, five days, is not uh, enough to capture it well. But on the bottom of the slide, with the Venus, 
you capture very well all the different stages, all the different phenological stages of this red seed flowering. And this is very important to increase our knowledge on the modelization of the crop and to improve much more variables linked to the vegetation and to the phenology like the CO2, the biomass estimation and so on. And this, this shows that the time of visit of Venus is really crucial to have this knowledge. And Arthur will give you more details on this now. Thank you, Jean-Louis. So the next uh, scientific application that we want to show you today that is um, the optimization of a CO2 balance uh, model uh, by assimilating Venus products. So the main objective of that kind of model is to forecast the regional CO2 budget of a specific crop field. So this model is based on several parameters such as plant photosynthesis, soil respiration, or crop growth and senescence. In our case, in the, the Venus case, the, um, the Green Era Index, so or GAE, is the, the parameter at stake. And the Venus data allows us to come to optimize this kind of model by comparing the GAI uh, forecast of this model and the GAI computed thanks to thanks to Venus products with I uh, represent. As uh, Arnold told you just before, uh, the, the Venus agility uh, helps us for a multi-angular application. You can see here um, an example of a, of a multi-angular multi accusation over was one scientific site, Gallo site in the, in the USA. So um, we have here the Gallo P30 is the first acquired view with a, a forward view, then uh, Gallo in a nardier view, and finally Gallo M30 the, with a, a backward view. So these triple acquisition are really useful to study directional effects. As you can see on the, the small animation at the bottom of the of this slide, this extract of, uh, of uh, the Gallo acquisition highlights the shadows moves and the, the in changes of in light intensi intensity on, on buildings. It means that orientation and color change depend on the sun, uh, on the sun uh, orientation. So if we create an unusual RGB composition, as you can see on the right of the slide, with the backward view, the narrow view, and the forward view of the same spectral band, you can directly study the crop orientation from directional effect. In this image, the red color is associated to uh, vineyard oriented from west to east, and the gray color is associated to, to the same vineyard, but oriented from north to south. This is really useful to include the directional effect into theoretical models such as DART3D, which is an algorithm developed in the SESBIO laboratory in France. And finally, the, the last um, scientific application that we want to show you today concerns the future prospects. So, uh, as we, we said earlier, Venus is a unique combination between high revisit and high resolution. And the, the, this ben, these Venus products are really important to test, prepare, create, and validate some algorithm which use, uh, which, uh, use the, these both advantages of high revisit and high resolution. So the first algorithm on the left of this slide is, which is called CARN and developed by the, the CESBIO laboratory is a super resolution algorithm. So thanks to the diversity of the landscape seen by Venus and the, its spectral similarity to Sentinel-2, we can improve, we can simulate an, an improvement of the, of the spatial resolution of, of Sentinel-2 uh, Sentinel product from 10 meters to five meters. The second algorithm on the on the right, which is called Star FM and also developed by SaysBio, uh, is based on the on the spatial temporal merging. This the objective of this algorithm is to merge the um, the data of one future mission Sentinel HR, which uh, have a 
a resolution of two meters and a revisit cycle of five days with Sentinel-2 mission, which have uh, which has a resolution of 10 meters and a revisit of five days. So, so this algorithm allows us to simulate one uh, one product with uh, high resolution at a, um, a date we don't where we don't have any information about it. So, in this case, we can see uh, three different uh, Venus that Venus product at three different dates, and the star FM could predict the the Venus uh, Venus acquisition at a given date thanks to uh, thanks to a Sentinel two acquisition at the same date and Venus acquisition at different dates. And on the on the bottom of the slide, you can see the uh, in, in grayscale the prediction error between the star FM simulation and Venus data, and it's quite it's quite the, these errors are quite low, and and the results are quite impressive. So to conclude, after more than four years in orbit now, uh, clearly Venus gives Kness and ISA complete satisfaction. Uh, in fact, we have excellent performances on the radiometric domain, on the geometric side also, and we have been able to acquire a high-quality time series on a wide range of different climate and uh, different surface type during the first phase of the mission. And these uh, enable us, as you can you are, you are seen in this presentation, in these two presentations, uh, we have been able to validate a lot of image processing algorithms and to study the land surface in... Um, uh, and the land surface evolution, thanks to the time series and the dynamic of the, of the Venus satellite, on a wide range of uh, different surface states. And now, of course, we are looking forward for the next mission, the VM5 mission, with a one-day revisit period, which will surely have a new time dimension and will give much more opportunities to validate even more new algorithms for the benefit of the Earth, of course, which is the topic today. Thank you very much. Yes. For the bathymetry, I don't have exactly. I don't have, have only the, the 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 number of the error we have in the type in the measurements. I don't have the the exact uh, uh, depth max we have. But you 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 have all the the references. And uh, if you go to see this, uh, I think it's a, the 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 second uh, reference. You have all the details of the method and also about the, this parameter. But I don't have the in in mind the exact uh, number of the depth. But as you can see in the slide, we, we think that we can have a, well, a very well uh, uh, important uh, value of the, the depth we can retrieve with Venus. But you, have, you are, all, all, uh, you are uh, limited by the thrust of the Venus, which is 27 kilometers, as it has been said. So in terms of uh, the large of the thrust, you can't have uh, many more uh, depths. But I don't have the, the quite the number of this uh, resolution. And the 3D, on the, on the, um, I think on the topographic uh, part, that is to say the above, above water, the um, root mean square error for the altitude is um, 1.1 1 .1 meter, I think. Yes, it was in the, in the Venus, uh, uh, Venus of bathymetry slide, I had this figure. Uh, you, you mentioned sure revisit is a relook time with the off nadir angle of the platform, I think, in this case, during the acquisition. Is the revisit of two days or one day at the end is a, a relook using the off nadir of platform, the movement of the attitude of the satellite. What is the limits angle that you accept for the quality of your image 
in off Nadir, for instance. During the next During the time? During the operation, huh? you acquire some images of Nadir. The, what is an acceptable angle that you accept, that you that you consider for? So, uh, 30, 30 degrees. 30, 30 degrees. Okay. okay. Tilting viewing 30 degrees. Thirty. Okay, thank you. Any more questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. We will move to the Shalom Shalom project now. So hi again, uh, for the Shalom project, I have the honor to present with Francesco, thank you. Um, I will start and he will continue. So actually, this is a slide with many bullets and many words, but I think that they all convey an important message. You don't have to read them all. It's, the message is that space is an important field and a great opportunity to collaborate between countries, between two leading remote sensing countries. And that's the whole idea. So in 2016, there was a, um, a, the Memorandum of Understanding Agreement on the hyperspectral um, satellite, which is named Shalom. And that's the story. Okay, so would you like to present? Uh, yes, uh, two key words, two or three key words in order to, to better focalize on this project. The, the first key words is, uh, I said, is a cooperation, because uh, uh, in this project we try to merge our capabilities, our, uh, uh, what we, we can do better and do to realize uh, the, the best instrument uh, in, uh, in, in the upper spectrum. The second one is communities, because we start with the, the communities uh, really involved from the development phase. We start with uh, some uh, scientific uh, uh, process. And also regarding the, the science and application in hyperspectral is uh, almost an, an artificial division. It's not so clear because it is something confusing because uh, between uh, uh, application and science. The, the third, third word that is very important for us is continuity because of PRISMA mission. And uh, at the end, uh, the, the ambition to have the best performance respect to that, that what we have already in, in, in orbit, that is PRISMA. Consider this point, in, uh, in, uh, in this case, uh, we, we focalize uh, on uh, combining best class in uh, technologies from both sides, from Israeli and from Israeli and from Italian part. And uh, uh, focalizing on commercial, considering that uh, uh, PRISMA is now in orbit, is free and open with some characteristics, and uh, uh, enhancing the performances of what we have already in in, in I. And uh, the resolution. Resolution, not only we have already 10 nanometers in spectral resolution. What we want to do, we want to pass from 30 meters in 240 bands, in more bands in, in Shalom at 10, 10 meters. Okay, the, this is uh, the, the our uh, uh, companies uh, from Israeli and Italian part involved. We have the, 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 the I think from, from Italy and from Israel, we have the, the, the best companies in our respective countries involved. What's about the, the mission characteristics? Revisit time is four days, the, uh, more than uh, uh, 200 kilometers, square kilometers of uh, every day as acquisition capacity worldwide coverage, the, the, the spectral range is as usual from uh, visible in the, the part of reflective part of the spectrum, then in the visible near infrared and short wave infrared, as in Prisma, with uh, more bands acquired from 240 bands to 275 bands. And uh, considering both characteristics, not only hyperspectral, but also panchromatic on board, because we see on, on Prisma, this is very important for the users to have 
this information in simultaneously in, uh, during the acquisition. The resolutions confirm it at 10 meters, and uh, uh, in, uh, in this case, uh, the, the large effort in, uh, is in uh, the special resolution of 10 meters. And also the, the, the pan resolution is from 5 meters to 2.5. And now consider how the work is, share, is shared on, uh, on the side of ground. We decided to have a, 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 a very integrated system for uh, the, the, the ground segment for the satellites. We see after how the satellites is, uh, is uh, divided between the, the, our, our uh, effort and, uh, and the Isra Israeli effort. Considering the, the ground, we have the MCC in Italy, then the, the control of planification and the spacecraft control center in Israel with a strong in interface and in interrelations between these two elements. The satellite is uh, the fantastic machine of uh, our friends. It is a, is a compact satellite with a fantastic GMC ground motion maneuver compensation. And it is, this is uh, the real key elements that can permit us to reduce the, the resolution that enhance the performance of, uh, of the system. Of course, uh, the, the, the lifetime is also five years, but uh, we expect that, uh, as usual in space, we double <laughs> the, this lifetime. Uh, what, uh, the, what about uh, the hyperspectral payload? The, the hyperspectral payload is a, is a very complicated machine. We have uh, uh, the, the part of the four optics, uh, with the telescope that is common for hyperspectral channels, the, the uh, uh, near and near, the visible and near infrared, and the short wave infrared, with uh, two different, of course, detector and uh, the focal plane, and the, the panchromatic. There is some commonalities. We have, of course, the, 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 the brazel, that is the plane that divides the part of uh, the, the optics, the telescope, and the part of uh, with, a, with a, some uh, folding mirrors that uh, uh, amplify in the case of uh, magnifies the, in the case of panchromatic uh, the, 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 the effect of uh, the, um, the, the light that uh, is acquired from uh, the telescope. This is uh, the, the project of the hyperspectral payload. Of course, in, in this case, uh, we have uh, uh, several optics uh, that uh, uh, move uh, and concentrate uh, uh, from the slit in the, in the, in the lower part. On top of the brazel, on, uh, on the plane. And uh, uh, in, in this case, we have, uh, we have uh, 77 uh, 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 visible and near infrared uh, spectral lines and 198 uh, and almost 200 lines spectral lines of uh, uh, in uh, in the short wave infrared this is uh, the the part uh, on uh, on the telescope uh, I, I don't go inside on on, uh, on this project uh, on this part of uh, only only to to show you the the, the part of the core in, in the red uh, uh, and the red part uh, uh, signated there is, uh, is, uh, is where we, we split the, the signal from, from the telescope in the three uh, elements. Uh, now, uh, this is the, the panchromatic payload. We have a, a very good uh, uh, MTF, and uh, the GSD is, as I said before, 2.5 uh, meters. In conclusion, this is a, a successful cooperation between Italy and Israel, and uh, we hope uh, that uh, we can uh, assist to the launch of this system as soon as possible, also to guarantee the continuity of uh, hyperspectral observation. There is a uh, strong heritage of uh, OPSAT 3000 satellite and uh, Prisma payload that uh, is, a, is a change also for us because on Prisma we use the, uh, the, the Prism I say that the stone inside, this is a grating system. And uh, uh, we, 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 we trust in this project uh, and we are sure that uh, all the ambitious goal will be reached. Thank you, Francesco. And a few last words for me. I think that um, the Shalom project has some unique 
characteristics. I think that 10 meter uh, resolution for spectral bands is one of a kind. I think that when we have panchromatic aligned with the hyperspectral payload is very important as well. It gives us many options for data fusion and to other AI applications, um, which we will hear about later. And of course, it gives us a commercial applications, which is also very important for using this extremely extraordinary machine. So thank you very much. Thank you for the presentation. What kind of system will be in the um, in the onboard calibration system? Do you know it? Yeah. We have uh, the calibration system is uh, is easier to see onboard calibration. System. There is no uh, the sun is not sun is using lamp of course because we have to respect all the the spectrum where uh, we have to, 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 to test, to check uh, every time the performances and eventually to modify the, the, cali the, the, the part of the characterization and calibration using that one. Okay, so now we will move on to Dr. Fabrizia Giorno, please. Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much to the invitation to this uh, event. Um, I am a, a director of technology at NGVE, but I'm also the president of the GEOS company, that is uh, a company that is shared between ASI and uh, Telespazio. So today, since uh, this uh, double nature of myself, I would like to present uh, in some uh, uh, evolution between uh, of uh, spectral uh, emissions and sensors. So going from science to applications, that means uh, also to operational activities and commercial activities. First of all, I want to um, enlighten, to remark that uh, we are uh, facing a changing earth, mainly due to the increasing of population and human activities that uh, also as uh, effects in climate change and also increase the threats and risks for our society and infrastructure. But we're living uh, in, a, in a changing world also of, from the te te technology point of view. So uh, new missions, new sensor, hyperspectral in, in this case, will of course contribute to possibly mitigate those risks and uh, also bring together the community and cooperation between countries. So let's have a look, start to look at what uh, spectral satellite uh, imaging instruments are, uh, what are they special? Uh, of course, uh, we have uh, the, the, the multispectral imagers give a lot of information as we just saw from uh, the Venus uh, missions and others. But hyperspectral uh, um, sensors uh, give uh, uh, more um, specific information on chemical components, both from the surface and atmosphere. So that's a, a, a peculiar uh, characteristic of uh, hyperspectral sensor. As you see in the cube uh, on the right, you can see the surface information and then the spectral information that give you the the, the insights of uh, what is on, on the surface. Um, now I just give, uh, uh, since I'm, um, I will uh, focus on what is uh, already on flying, that is the PRISMA mission, 
and uh, what uh, is uh, the, what how the Prisma mission is used uh, to uh, analyze uh, the evolution of products uh, like uh, uh, or other or other mission like Prisma. So has he started these uh, activities longer time ago in the in the starting of the 2000 years uh, with Ipseo mission and then with JHM mission with Canada. Uh, and then so was I able to develop uh, a PRISMA program that is a, a current uh, space mission and of course collaborate for uh, the evolution of this mission and uh, in particular with, for Shalom that we are uh, talking about today. Uh, PRISMA uh, is uh, been launched in 2019. Uh, is uh, having uh, is uh, uh, having uh, a characteristic of uh, 30 meter resolution and uh, uh, he has the 29 days uh, of uh, repetition cycle but since he's pointing instruments uh, you, you can have a look time of less than seven days and can acquire about 200 uh, images per day and have a swath of 50 meter, 50 kilometers and uh, of course has also panchromatic channel of five meters that can be used to combine or, or to uh, sh make fun sharpening of, of, uh, of uh, the hyperspectral uh, images. So we start uh, to, uh, within uh, the, 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 the ASI um, advisory board, uh, we selected uh, uh, and, and now many sites that can cover a lot of uh, different applications and located worldwide. So this is a very encouraging also to testing the uh, development of algorithms and, uh, and products for this or many uh, different uh, application. And since it's an open data policy, there are a lot of uh, different uh, requests coming from all over the world. Uh, but I need to enlighten the problem, uh, well, not the problem, but so I would say the complexity of hyperspectral missions. The hyperspectral mission needs a very precise radiometric calibration, and that means coming going from digital numbers to radiance, that is the LN1, L1 products to reflectance. Those are the base for the especially, of course, for scientific application, but especially for commercial or operational. Uh, uh, use of the epispectral data. So it ver it's very important to have uh, uh, ground calibration sites around the world, the sharing of the data acquired on these sites that could be, uh, um, uh, that may also have uh, is permanent instruments on, uh, officially, or uh, usually for epispectral, that has to be. Um, or very high reflectance surfaces or low reflectance and also for validation could be agriculture site or or what or a coastal area so but the, the for calibration they have to be homogeneous so we have to take in, in mind that uh, here there is a, a possible calval site in Israel that uh, um, is um, is uh, in, in, in an area that uh, shows I reflectance and as a desert uh, area and uh, of course uh, it can be used uh, both for calibration and validation activity not only for hyperspectral also for thermal channels and uh, i just present uh, one possible one site that is uh, we used in italy for a long time is on top of the etna volcano it's a very flat surface and very homogeneous and black we use since uh, Hyperion, so many years, more than 10 years, uh, of uh, measuring the reflectance uh, that is uh, very low, more, less than the 0, 0 0.05 for in reflectance. So that's give you how this instrument is stable uh, is when you measure dark surfaces. So since, uh, so, Prisma is a very important to test different products. Already gives uh, from level one to level two C product, and gives different uh, uh, possibility to analyze uh, activities and, and um, application that covers from agriculture to urban 
for uh, natural risks, uh, forest and and uh, and uh, coastal areas. Just to give you a, a small view of the roadmap of the spectral satellites and uh, what could be the global market perspective, um, I take this slide. But of course, uh, there are a moving. Uh, uh, there are many mission under studies. There are some uh, for governments, so from the agencies, some are commercials. And, uh, and so we expect to have a lot of this data in the near future. And uh, of course, uh, there will be an increase all, also of uh, the use of this data at the uh, worldwide level, and especially in, in the emerging countries, Africa, South America, and, and Asia. But for hyperspectral, we have to understand what are the emerging applications, but also we have to prepare the users and engage them, understanding their needs, and uh, therefore uh, trans translate the user requirements in technical requirements both for missions and products, uh, since uh, the hyperspectral give a very specific information. This has to be prepared in order to open for a large kind of, of, of commercial operational application. Going to EGEO's activities, uh, uh, I just give you a very uh, short overview of what is being done in the last year, starting from uh, JHM phase uh, study. Of course, uh, the Shalom uh, mission preparatory phase of Emprisma that is currently used to test the products. And also CHIME that is the, the, the mission under study by the ESA. So we have uh, in the, inside the GEO, so we focus uh, on a specific application that goes from uh, uh, coastal uh, water quality, vegetation indication, fires, due in terms of fuel maps and also detection of specific material and in collaboration with INGV to understand the very rapid changing phenomena as fires and volcanic eruption. So those are for water quality, so suspending materials, presence of algae and the mapping of uh, the, the sediments in the coastal area. Uh, for agriculture, of course, uh, many indicators like uh, the leaf area index, uh, chlorophyll, uh, and FPR, uh, and uh, other information that uh, can tell us uh, about uh, the state and uh, well and and uh, and of the uh, the of the, uh, the agriculture and uh, their health of, of uh, the, the plants. Uh, for what regarding the, the technic special uh, um, constituent of special uh, features on the on the on the ground, like in this case, uh, uh, the hyperspectral sensors uh, were used to detect the presence uh, of um, um, of um, the, the, the the power plant uh, the, um, uh, on the ground. Um, Solar, in this case, solar panels, sorry. And uh, for uh, the propagation of, uh, of fire and, and to analyze the fire hazard maps, also hyperspectral data has been tested to compute uh, vulnerability maps and uh, uh, the information on where you have the, the most risk for accumulated fuels that can be then uh, provoked can be say the, 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 the fuel of course of, of fires uh, that could be mostly man-made um, unfortunately. Going to very the very rapid uh, um, um, phenomena, uh, hyperspectral sensor could be very useful especially if they have a, a, they can re have a revisit time of one day or so or maybe one or two day that is uh, the, 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 this, in this kind is needed for, for uh, monitoring fires, the possibility to detect the emissions of uh, potassium during the combustion of plants. And that's, uh, as you see, uh, using the testing ISPIRI or Hyperion, ISPIRI now SBG studies, 
Prisma and Hyperion, we see that uh, we are able to possibly detect the, the, the cap emissions and therefore uh, uh, we can retrieve uh, the front, the flame front uh, uh, by the spectral data, which is uh, an important product uh, uh, because also can detect the front through clouds. For volcanoes, uh, of course, hyperspectral data are very interesting, both for the thermal feature and the gas emissions. Volcanoes are everywhere. And, uh, but just uh, to give you an overview, in the different uh, volcanic phase, we can use hyperspectral data. On the top, you see the, 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 gassing, you, the, anal the analysis of the gassing plumes. Especially, we can detect CO2 uh, in some uh, like, in kind of volcano, also a, a, um, methane, uh, and uh, with other channels, we can also study sulfur dioxide. For enduring crisis phases, the spectral data are very important to measure temperatures and the fusion rates that give you the, 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 the it's using the models to know where lava flows are going, and so understanding the risk for cities and other human activities. And in post-crisis, they can be very well used to determine maps of products, so where the like lava flows or other products are in place after the eruption. So, and finally, gas like CO2 is very an important task that can be retrieved by um, spectral data. Of course, it's a difficult algorithm because uh, there is a lot of CO2 in the atmosphere, but Prisma uh, showed that uh, uh, as a capability. Just uh, to conclude, to show you um, an eruption of Mount Etna we had in February 2021 that uh, lasted for several days. So we make the use of, uh, of Prisma data also combined with S2 data to, uh, to model and to reconstruct the growing of the lava flow. So that is uh, an operational uh, uh, application that can be achievable if we go toward the operational hyperspectral sensors like Shalom. I finish and I would like to thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> if there is questions. Thank you very much, Fabrizia. Now we will move on to Professor Alvendo. Thank you very much for being here and to be patient to stay for the last presentation of the day. My name is Eyal Bendor. I am the head of the Remote Testing Laboratory at Tel Aviv University within the Department of Geography, Porter School of Environmental and Health Science. I would like to speak today and also to uh, highlight the Shalom, which is a very unique sensor that um, brings a game changer to the field of remote sensing and also for hyperspectral activity. So Shalom is, uh, of course, a uh, hi, uh, goodbye, and many other very nice words, and also peace uh, in Hebrew language, but also it stands for the Spaceborne Hyperspectral 
application land and ocean mission. So the copywriter were very uh, fruitful here in this regard. So just to remind you, in uh, 2012, uh, the agreement was signed, was signed between the two space agencies to uh, go for the hyperspectral uh, direction. And uh, why hyperspectral? Because hyperspectral is very, very unique uh, technology. It's not uh, new, it's quite old, it's 30 years already in the market. It is actually, uh, if we uh, define it uh, scientifically, simultaneous acquisition of images in many spectrally continuous and narrow bands across one or all, and this is very new, of the UV, Visnir, SWIR, mid-wave infrared and low-wave infrared. So we are covering the entire, let's say, passive uh, radiation that we can get uh, on Earth. So it is a spectra. If we have a look on the each pixel, we are seeing spectral fingerprint of the material. So there is no two spectral fingerprint of uh, the same material. So it's a really fingerprint. This is what is nice and unique in this technology. So in general, the technology is effective use in numerous remote sensing uh, application that require the estimation of physical parameters of many complex surfaces. The current hyperspectral technology is, com is complemented by powerful sensor capable covering large surfaces of, of the Earth. So, all in all, we have a killer technology. We used to look or reach for the killer application, but no, we have killer technology. We saw a lot of applications before uh, from Fabrizia, but we have so many applications that we don't have it yet in our mind. When we uh, went for the phase one of uh, Shalom, we mapped the uh, resolutions, the hyper, uh, sorry, the special resolution, the, the spectral resolution, and the temporal resolution, and uh, we put much, uh, more, uh, m much of the sensors that were available at that time and also in the future, and we found out that there is a gap here, a space gap that uh, we need to fill up, and this is, of course, by Shalom. Shalom has a nice revisit uh, time. It has a very nice uh, spatial resolution, even with the spectral uh, configuration. And also it has lots of uh, spectral bands. So together we have, as you understand, very nice and good technology that we can start and do something that we uh, need to do in quantitative uh, dimension and uh, qualitative uh, demonstration. So the general hyperspectral remote sensing is uh, currently uh, using ex exceptional, ex exceptional special spectral and temporal resolution. So we use the spectral information, the spectral domain is very important. However, the Shalom will provide us with high special spectral and temporal resolution. And just to illustrate these resolutions, look at the low temporal resolution of the regular a remote sensing sensor in orbit today and that will be in the future. And this will what Shalom will bring us together with the spectral, high spectral resolution. But one more thing about Shalom is it will provide commercial uh, commercialization pillar. And this is very important because most of the sensor, most of the activities and the missions today are scientifically oriented. Why commercialization? This is a good question. And I would like to spotlight on this uh, direction by taking you to a company named Mordor Intelligence. And this uh, company have investigated the, the, the systems that were sold between uh, 2000 uh, and 2021, and also predicted the system uh, market uh, for 2026 and as you see there is a very nice compound annual rate growth of this this uh, systems and remember this is not the systems in the space it's system in the ground system in laboratory system in the field so the people the majority of the people understand the importance of hyperspectral remote sensing in more in many domains also they map the entire globe to see where are the most sensors that sold the, and, and also are used in uh, uh, globally. And as you see, there are two continents that still are seeking or they still don't know about 
hyperspectral uh, technology, and this is why Shalom will will be the killer uh, application or maybe a game changer to these continents. And also the company have found the uh, five pillars uh, for the hyperspectral remote sensor technologies, such as food and applications, uh, healthcare, defense, mining, and others. The others, this is something that we don't know yet. But we, with the phase one, found out this this, uh, these applications, this is the end product of Shalom that we found out within the phase one. And this is very, uh, I think, uh, attractive applications for the environmental uh, monitoring and also for having food security issues. So if we mark, if we highlight those uh, applications that are belonging to the food security on, let's say, soil in this uh, regard, soil as you see, can be highlighted more than 40% of these applications. And this is the major important agent of this application. Why soil? Soil is a unique, unique, uh, unique uh, environmental uh, material. And if we look on the hyperspectral, hyperspectral cover the atmosphere, the lithosphere, the hydrosphere, biosphere, and cryosphere by spectral information. If we, if we look on the pedosphere, which is the soil, it is a combination of all these spheres. It's atmosphere, hydrosphere, and lithosphere, and biosphere together. So we are very, very lucky that we have a hyperspectral and shalom, because we're going to have the, the most of the spheres that can be depicted by the sensor. Soil. Why soil is so important? This is because soil brings, uh, it's critical to life and also it enables life on earth and it is a very important pillar for soil uh, food security. Here you see uh, 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 some uh, information from The Guardian, some uh, papers that are published by The Guardian. And they were concerned about the soil degradation that's happening today because of the climatic change issue. So what we are doing with soil that will be helping Shalom to provide commercial uh, issues, commercial uh, end uh, product to the user, is we build a soil spectral library, huge soil spectral library with the soil information either from spectral domain, also from traditional uh, chemistry and physics, uh, physical uh, characteristics of the soil. And also because we are doing this uh, in a, in a global-wide, we have lots of laboratories over the world that are doing this under our uh, supervision. We need to have uh, some standard and protocol for doing it because we would like to have the same soil spectral library globally-wide uh, providing information for Shalom. For that, we have an activity with the IEEE. We call it P4005 standard protocol and scheme for measuring soil spectroscopy. It has also very, very uh, good uh, connection and important connection to the Shalom end product. If you take a look on this slide, you see how many samples and how many laboratories worldwide are taking. Uh, taking part of this activity and uh, they are collaborating with us and this data will be eventually free for the Shalom and will be analyzed for the soil pillar. What we will do with the analysis of the soil, we will, we will do a modeling, we will model the, the spectral information and by this, this modeling we can apply this pixel by pixel and get information about the soil and provide this information to the end user. So if we are speaking about the spectral library, why soil is so important in terms of spectroscopy, this is a, this is a paper that uh, published recently by my colleague, and he was evaluating all spectral uh, methodology to understand soil, and he marked here with the, with the uh, he highlighted the, the soil spectral information reflectance that is actually providing us the most important information about the soil. So we are very lucky also from this, this side. So 
understanding that in Shalom we will have a R&D center that will provide the final uh, map or uh, uh, thematic map for the user. And this is the area that they will see. So somebody from China, for instance, will send coordinates, coordinates to the center and he will ask for solving the problem. Map for me the soil salinity, for instance. Map for me the potassium deficiencies in the in the field. And he will provide, this guy from the R&D center will provide information to the other guy sitting next to him. And they will generate a regional quantitative soil map. This soil map will provide back to the end user. And as you see here, they found out a, a spot a hot spot of some problem in the soil and this information will be uploaded to the tractor and the tractor will manage or will uh, cultivate the soil in a very very smart uh, way so all together we will have the soil information on any of them i'm providing you information i provide you ex example of soil but we can do that with vegetation water whatever you really uh, think that is a uh, important for you and uh, this information will uh, of course uh, be captured by the sensor and then be back to the to the uh, to the to earth and we will by the r d center provide the model to the farmer and here you see a soil map such as soil salinity this is a real map that have been actually extracted from hyperspectral sensor so i would like to give you some very very small taste uh, to to open your you open your appetite for soil uh, application from Shalom and this is a high end product that we already uh, achieved to uh, to get. First of all, this is uh, one of the papers that is today uh, seems to be pioneer in soil spectroscopy or soil hyperspectral remote sensing. This is taken from very old hyperspectral sensor in orb, in, in, in air. He was, was airborne sensor of the German uh, ELR. And here you see that we were able to map five, uh, sorry, four important soil properties at the same time. Soil moisture, soil salinity, soil specific surface area, and soil organic matter. And this paper have been cited more than 4, 400 times. Recently, we were able to show in Italy, in Sele River, uh, southern Italy, we showed that we can also map the infiltration, water infiltration rate to the soil by doing a modeling of infiltration measurement in the field and spectral uh, measurement also in the field. And this is very important uh, map that can be sent to the farmer and he can actually use this map to cultivate the soil for the next rain event in order to cultivate or harvesting more uh, rain drop water and prevent them to uh, wash out to the sea and have uh, erosion and uh, runoff. Another nice uh, example is in South Africa, we were able to detect uranium contamination in the soil using, of course, the mod model that uh, actually highlighting the uranium spectral features. So I would like to conclude and summarize my talk by saying that Shalom sensor is a game changer in the new era of hyperspectral remote sensing technology from space. Hyperspectral technology from space under Shalom program has a bright economy future and can be termed as a killer technology. In Israel and Italy, we have a strong foundation for developing new commercial applications for Shalom high products, and Israel leads an own unique soil spectral library and leads the IEEE uh, Standard Association to foster utilization of global and standard soil spectral library for mapping soil attributes using Shalom R&D Center to improve food security issues. Thank you for your attention, and I'm open the floor for questions if you do help.
I would like to invite Mr. Uri Oron for the closing remarks, please. Thanks, Professor Bender. I think that was a, a really, really great example of what we can do, what needs to be done. Uh, and I really like uh, uh, the way you connected the dots between the technology and the potential applications. And I think this is exactly what we meant when we just discussed it. I mean, what we need to do is just put it on the right field, on the right time. And that's a big challenge. Now, uh, we highlight a few points, but I think a uh, 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 very, very interesting presentation that we just saw um, basically uh, says it all. Venus, on one hand, is already there. What we need to do is to take a much better advantage of the capabilities of, of Venus. The way, we, the way we should do it is, first of all, following the plans that we already have, uh, the next phase, Phase five, I think, is going to be fascinating. Uh, but we need something more. We need to put more partners into it. And I think that's another big challenge uh, in front of us. Uh, the partners could be partners from the government sector, such as UAE. But the partners could be from other places. Uh, research, academy, and from the, and from the private sector. We need to find a path in Venus as well. We discussed it in Shalom, but we need to find the path in Venus uh, uh, as well. So the scientific and the commercial potential of those two projects is huge. But what, we, what is for sure that those two, uh, are those two leading uh, uh, projects are very, very important. We saw it in Venus, and I will use the term game changer in Shalom because I do believe that it is a game changer. Uh, uh, when uh, when both of you spoke about the potential of, this, of of the system of dealing with some of the biggest challenges of the world uh, right now, I think that's that, that that's highlighting everything. That's that's what we need to find the path to be part of the solution to those problems, and we can do it with that with, with such a game changer. Uh, so, so with that, I think it's, it, it's a great, it's a great and very, very bright future in front of us. And I would like to address, you spoke about the continuity, uh, and let's, let's put it even more uh, plan, budget, money. Uh, I would like to address it as a challenge and not as a problem. It is a challenge, not only in Israel, I believe it is a challenge. Uh, that we must face and we must address and we must answer. The way to answer the challenge, this challenge, is to explain, and I think this is part of my job, uh, to explain the benefits of such systems, the benefits of such technology for both research and commercial applications. Uh, I think, I've got the, I do believe that what's happening in the world right now especially in the climate change, but as well as the changing in the space industry as a whole, could bring us very soon to the place that there will be much more listeners than in the past. I do believe that we can do it. But this is, I guess, this is one of the biggest challenges. But to try to sum, sum uh, uh, what we've just uh, saw and hear in the last couple of hours, uh, the potential over there, uh, the cooperation between the nations, between the countries, between the organizations, between sectors, and between people. This is the, the, the basic, the basic uh, uh, milestone that will lead us forward. And this exists in this room. It exists in our listeners in other places. Um, you know, those two LOIs that we just signed yesterday with the UE is another uh, uh, great example for that. So I think the cooperation uh, between us could lead us forward. Again, thanks very much for the presentation. Thanks very much for being here. Thanks very much to uh, all of the others that uh, uh, listened to us um, and uh, for a very, very bright future. Let's move forward. Thank you. I think, yeah, with the flags.